Sure. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Sure. I, I just wasn't. I wasn't sure why you were asking, but yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. All right. Uh, today we're going to talk about website accessibility, and with website accessibility is sort of an extension of the whole notion that the web is to be um, as universal as possible. In other words, it's not the Microsoft Wide Web that only works on Internet Explorer, and it's not the Google Wide Web that only works on Chrome. It's meant to be universal, and it's meant to work across platforms, and it's meant to work, you know, as we found out uh, recently, via mobile device, but also, let's remember the people involved, that it's meant to work regardless of the person accessing it and whatever abilities or disabilities they may happen to have. The obvious disability that affects people in accessing the web is people that are blind. How, are, how do people that are blind access the web? Well, they access the web through the use of a piece of what is called assistive technology. All right. In fact, in general terms, the, the way that people with different disabilities are accommodated on the web is through a combination of two things. Assistive technology and principles of what are called universal design. Assistive technology is any sort of combination of hardware and software that helps people access the web in spite of their disabilities. Universal design are some techniques that can be employed that really make the web a better experience for everyone, including those with disabilities. Let's look at some assistive technologies, and we'll see if we can get this to work. There's some that are built into Windows, by the way. Um, one of them is, if we go here, Start magnifier. Oops. Um, I'm going to go and click Start Narrator. And let me turn up the volume. I hope everyone can hear this. Initializing narrator. Let's go and open up. Location bar. Desktop backslash all controlled analyze. Controlled. Location bar. Desktop backslash all controlled analyze items backslash start on screen keyboard button. Lo control panel home hyperlink. Icon hyperlink. Change administrative settings hyperlink. Vertical scroll bar at 0%. Help hyperlink. Make your computer easier to use. Alright, let's, let's go hit refresh. Initializing narrator. There we go. Look, enter. Microsoft narrator with exit narrator window focused on yes button contains yes button no button are you sure you want to exit narrator okay it's, it's, it's a little bit behind me my, my keystrokes but Let me open up. Initializing narrator. Rigid host window pane. Oh, Contain I know what I've been doing. I've been closing pane. it. Tab holder pane. 
I've been Temper closing there. Let me just minimize page, it instead. Location bar. There we go. Desktop backslash all controlled anal items backslash ease of access center. Focus on start narrator button. Control panel home hyperlink. Icon hyperlink. Change administrative settings hyperlink. Vertical scroll bar at 0%. Help hyperlink. Make your computer easier to use. Quick access. And what it's Location doing is bar. it's reading this. Desktop backslash all controlled anal items backslash ease of access center. Focus on start narrator button. Control panel home hyperlink. Icon hyperlink. Change administrative settings hyperlink. Vertical scroll bar at 0%. Help hyperlink. Make your computer easier to use. Quick access to common tools. You can use the tools in this section to help you get started. Windows can read and scan this list automatically. Press the space bar to select the highlighted tool. Always read this section aloud checkbox is unchecked. Always scan this section checkbox is checked. Image. Start magnifier button. Image. Start narrator button. Image. Start on screen keyboard button. Image. Set up high contrast button. Get recommendations okay. I to think make you your get computer the idea. easier to use hyperlink. Explore all settings. Exit narrator window. I Focus think he... on yes button. Contains yes <laughs> button. No button. Are you sure you... <laughs> I did not say that. Um, I think you get the idea. Now, um, you, you, you look at that, and, and everyone, every class that I show this to sort of has the same reaction, like, wow, you know. But think about it. If there was no other way that you could access the computer other than that, then that would be an awesome thing, right? That would be an awesome thing, and, and you would make do, and you would figure out how to use it. Um, when I worked, uh, I, I did a couple summer fellowships at the NASA Glenn Research Center, and one of the years, my office mate was a high school girl that was blind. She was like a high school sophomore, I think. Freshman or sophomore, I think. But at any rate, it was amazing seeing her First of all, finding her way around that NASA campus. That was something I had a hard time doing because it's such a big campus and it's very confusing where all the buildings are and so on. But more so than that, when I would come in in the morning, you know, I'm kind of a late, late uh, riser. I'm not necessarily there very early, but she would typically be there in, in the office with the lights completely out which, you know, if you're blind, you don't need lights, right? With her monitor off, and she would be working on the computer. It was, just, it was just an odd sight. She didn't even need to turn the monitor on because the screen was narrating it. Now, it, it was amazing. She did virtually everything that, that a person that could see would do on a computer. She browsed the Internet. She created PowerPoint presentations, anything that you could think of. On occasion, she would get stuck on something something that was confusing, and she would ask me, she should ask me to come over and take a look at her screen and tell her what's going on or whatever, and I would do that. But for the most part, she worked very, very independently. And that's amazing of what people with different disabilities can do when they're simply given the accommodations to sort of somewhat even the playing field a little bit. I don't know if any of you watched uh, or, or seen, like, the, the, they have typically every Olympic year, they also have the Paralympics, where they have people with disabilities. But there's people that do and accomplish these most amazing athletic feats that are disabled, that don't have the use of their legs or whatever. It, again, it is, it's amazing to see, and it, it's, it's a tribute to um, the triumph of people um, that can overcome obstacles um, when they're just given a chance, when they're just given uh, somewhat of a fair chance. So at any rate, that's an example of assistive technology, the screen reader. It narrates the screen for, for the person, and it tells them. If you notice, it told them like when checkboxes were checked. It told them when um, the, the start narrator button had focus. It told them that they could use the space bar. Remember, a person that can't see can't use a mouse, right? Because they can't point on something on screen, so they need to navigate using the keyboard. All right? It did all those things, and it would enable someone to access 
the computer despite that. Now there's a number of other things that can be done. There are things that can take the uh, text from the screen and turn it into braille that people can read that way. All right? And so on. So this assistive technology is one thing that can happen. But the assistive technology by itself, unfortunately, isn't enough. Think in terms of, of real physical world disability. Someone may have a wheelchair, and that's a, an example of assistive technology, right? But if there's no elevator, how are they going to make it up to the second floor, right? Um, if there is, if the doors are very narrow, how are they going to get into the classroom if, the, if the, the door isn't wide enough to accommodate that? So in addition to the technology, there needs to be what I'm calling universal design. And the principle of universal design is this, that what you're going to do for people that are disabled is also, in some cases, going to benefit even people that don't have disabilities. Additionally, if it doesn't benefit people that don't have disabilities, it at least won't get in their way. It won't be like a, a, a problem for them. For example, every classroom, at least I believe that's the case, we'll have to check on the way out, I'm, I'm pretty sure in most buildings it is, every classroom has braille indicating the, the room number out front. How many of you have noticed that? You may or may not have noticed that. The point is, is that didn't like distract you. That didn't keep you from understanding that this was BU 105, all right? It didn't bother you one way or another. Either you notice it or you're not, all right? In other, yes? No, that's okay. Okay. The vending machines? Yeah. I, as soon as you started to say that you remember seeing someone on campus, I, I thought that's who you meant. Yeah, I, rem I remember that fellow too. And he would navigate his way through campus and he would fill the vending machines. And it's like, how do you know all that stuff? But, but they, they do, you know, and, and he does and he's able to do that. And again, the, the thing is, is when you have to do something, you know, you, you figure out a way to make it work. And, and that's, uh, again, that, that, that's very inspirational. Um, and there, there's little things that can accommodate someone like that. What are some of the things that they, they did on, in the building to accommodate someone like that? Do you remember some of the things they did? An elevator, yeah. Automatic doors, right? All right, those are, those are a couple good examples. Now, one thing about the principles of universal design is that the fact that there's automated doors, that could actually help someone who is, isn't even disabled. How could automatic doors help someone who isn't disabled? You're carrying a bunch of stuff, sure. All right. Uh, if you're carrying a bunch of stuff, you might not have a free hand to open the door, but if you can sort of like use your elbow to nudge the, 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 the switch, then, then you can open the door. How could an elevator, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I have not seen that, but yeah. Assistive technology, yeah. What about an elevator? How could an elevator uh, help someone who isn't, strictly speaking, disabled? One of those book bags on wheels, you're toting around a heavy bag. Yes. Quicker, yeah, if you're in a real hurry. And here's another case. I wouldn't consider myself disabled, right? However, as probably some of you know, I probably have told class before, in the spring I broke my hip. So I have three giant screws in my hip and it hurts sometimes, <laughs> all right? Um, and depending on the day, um, the steps are difficult for me. So I will, I don't consider myself disabled, but some days it's, it's better for me to take the elevator. It's like, you know, it, it saves me a little bit of soreness and pain. So that's the notion of universal design, is that 
In addition to thinking of people in two categories, of disabled and not disabled, there's really sort of a continuum, all right? Because yes, there's the dramatic cases, like someone that is totally blind, all right? You understand that those folks need some assistive technology. But there's other people that maybe have not the full disability, but have a milder case of it. What would be an example of a, uh, and I, I, he I hesitate to say milder case of blindness, but what are some examples of someone who isn't blind, but may have issues with their sight? Someone is colorblind. All right. Pardon me? Focusing issues, perhaps? Yeah, you're, 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 you're nearsighted or farsighted. You can tell that I have a bunch of younger students in here today. Otherwise, you'd say, when you get old, you have a hard time seeing, right? I mean, I have very bad, I was born with very bad eyesight. At least I assume I was born. I couldn't see anything until I was about five or six and someone decided to give me a pair of glasses. I won't say literally I couldn't see anything, but I probably saw everything as blobs until I was five or six and someone gave me glasses. But... When you get older, you have, you know, your eyesight diminishes. That's just a normal thing, all right? So I'm not blind. I have glasses. I mean, don't, don't worry if you see me driving on the road. I'm not going to hit you, probably, all right? But, but, uh, but there are some things that, that can be done for people with vision problems that aren't fully blind. And they're not going to bother people that have, perfect 2020 vision. What are some things that you could do for people to have lesser degrees of visual impairment? All right, glasses, that's an example of assistive technology. What about on the design side? What can you do to make it easier for people? Make the print. Make sure the print, make sure the font is, is of a readable size, absolutely. Right, that, that, that there's appropriate contrast between the background and the, the foreground. So, for example, you wouldn't use maybe red letters on an orange background or something like that where it would be difficult to see. All right? Think of that. that that's going to help people that don't have good vision. That's going to help people that are colorblind, certainly. You know, someone that is colorblind will possibly see just a gray blob in that case. All right? Depending on the specific kinds of colorblindness. But you know what? Every single one of you in here is going to benefit if they have a good contrast between the background and foreground. No one prefers to read orange font on a yellow background or yellow font on an orange background. That's just hard to read, period. I don't care if you have the eyesight of an eagle. That is difficult to read. So in some respects, some of these principles of universal design simply reinforce good web design principles anyhow, all right? That's why they benefit other people as well. But again, with a special, um, special catch in mind uh, that, that uh, it'll help people with disabilities. What can you, what's the something else that you could do for someone that's colorblind besides having a good contrast? That would be one thing. What would be another thing? Allow them to, to change the colors. Excellent suggestion. In other words, I think in Angel and on many, um, many pages, you have a choice of what color scheme to use. And you can go and you can pick a color scheme that is appropriate for you. Um, here is a, a site that is meant for people that are, that's a school for people that are blind and have otherwise visual impairment. And it allows you to customize at least some of the text, by color, and also by size. Now, there's some things that are built right into the browser that allow you to do this as well. But that's a good example where you can sort of put a theme on your pages, where you can allow people to switch between that. That, in a way, reinforces the one thing that I've been stressing since the beginning of, school, uh, of, of this uh, session, this, uh, the, this semester is that if you have a good separation between your CSS and HTML, then you can do something like that, right? You can go and you can write code 
that will, through just a little bit of JavaScript, you can write some code that will switch a style sheet from style A to style B and allow people to customize it. All right? What's something else you could do for someone that's colorblind? Okay, in, uh, you, you mentioned uh, uh, like a sound, an audio thing. Um, that, is, that is a, I, I'm not sure I would do that in this particular case, but that's a good um, general principle to represent things two different ways, all right, to people. So for example, if you have a photograph, also have a caption to the photograph that explains, you know, instead of a picture of me just sitting here, have a caption underneath it that says, here is Mike Zeller's lecturing to his CISS 216 class. All right? So you're presenting the information two different ways. You're showing a picture and you have text that explains it. Someone that's blind that can't see the picture at least can get the text narrated to them to see what that is. Now, extending your thought a little bit to showing something two different ways, um, we come to doing something with text besides simply changing the color. All right, let me, let me give you an example. If all the text on our page is black, let's say, and our links are blue, and that's the only difference between a link and the rest of the text on the page, that's probably not a good idea, right? Because if someone can't distinguish color, then the blue text and the black text, depending on the kind of color blindness they have, a person might not be able to tell the difference between the two or might not easily be able to tell the difference between the two. So what else could you do to a link besides change its color? Have it underlined? And in fact, that's the default, right? A default for a link is blue and underlined. All right, what's something else that you could do? Have it change when you hover over it? Have a bigger font? Have a different font? Have a smaller font? There's a whole bunch. Put it in italics. Put it in bold. There's all kinds of things that you could do to make your links look different other than color. So the idea of multiple presentations and universal design would be, I'm not just going to change the color on the link. I'm going to change the color and underline it. I'm going to change the color and put a border around it. I'm going to change the color and make it bold. So if you do two of these things, if someone can't pick up on the visual cue that the color's different, that it's a link, then they'll catch the other cue. All right? Um, and that's not going to bother someone that can see colors correctly. All right? They're, they'll just see the two different two differences instead of just the one difference. Now I've been speaking about color blindness, or I've been trying not to speak about color blindness as though all forms of color blindness are the same, right? Is there anyone that's color blind in the class? All right. There's actually different kinds of color blindness. It's not, it's not as though people that are color blind see in black and white. Um, depending on the kind of color blindness, um, some people, for example, uh, can't distinguish um, like red and green. Some people can't distinguish blue and yellow. I forget. But there is actually a resource available that can show you what your web page looks like to someone that's colorblind. All right, this isn't the one I had in mind, but it sort of gives you an idea. You can, for example, you can look at an image. Let's upload an image. One of those nice, beautiful Microsoft sample image. What would be a good one? Let's look at this jellyfish.
that must be under, and less than 650 KB. So that's probably the problem with it. This is 757, so let's go and resize this. Open with paint. And I will go in and sit here and stare for a while. Resize and skew. Let's make it half the size. So now it is down to 63 KB. All right, excellent. All right, that's what the picture looks like normally. All right, if you have red-green color blindness, this is what you'd see. About the same, right? A little bit different. If you have green color blindness, about the same. Blue color blindness, that's what you'd see. If you had red weak, I don't really see much of a difference. Green weak, blue weak, monochromatic would be black and white. And there is, there's even more variations than this. Um, but there are tools available. that allow you to look and check to see what your page um, looks like. Even for web pages. This one works for images. There's, there was one, there was one um, Uh, here we go. This is the one I was looking at. Let's go and let's put in a web page. Let's put in www.lorainecc.edu. And let's pick the kind of color blindness. And again, notice there's a whole list of them. So let's pick blue, yellow color blindness. And we'll go and we'll filter this. And this may take a minute, but eventually it will show us the page and what it would look like for someone that's colorblind. And that is someone that has that specific kind of colorblindness. I want to avoid saying colorblind because, again, there's different kinds of colorblindness. Yes? Uh, I imagine I see it the same way, yeah, the same way as represented that. It would be, be different. Yep. Now notice, let's compare that with the actual web page, with, with LC's actual web page. Now here's the point. There, there's nothing that you could do to make a colorblind person see the colors properly. But <coughs> when you look at the page, that is still workable, right? You can still read all the content. You can still distinguish what the links are. All right? So even though it doesn't look identical, there's nothing you can do to make it look identical as a web designer. There's no magic thing, spell that you can cast to make them and allow people with those forms of colorblindness to see it properly. But you can make sure that it's workable. All right, let's run this through another filter. This is a different, representing a different kind of color blindness. And again, if we can compare that to
that is a good question. That is probably a characteristic. Keep in mind that this is a simulator, so it's probably the simulator probably has a a a, a, a little bit. Of, I notice that too. That's a that's a really good question. My guess is that the simulator is just off a off a, 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 a just a tiny bit. To what what the student observed is that that the navigation looks a little different. It might be that the simulator doesn't have this font that LC is using and applies a different font to it. That would be my guess to it. All right. So we talked about things that you can do. And, and we talked about multiple presentation. So for colorblind people, you would put something in and you'd make sure that you didn't only use color. You know, don't put two buttons on your page. One of them that says, win a million dollars. The other one that says, reformat your hard drive. And then tell a colorblind person to press the green button, right? You could do something like that and, uh, you know, say press the bigger button, press the button with the text win a million dollars or whatever, all right? So you'd represent that content in two different ways. All right. For blind people, what are some things that you can do as far as multiple presentation? For people that are totally blind, what are some things that you can do as far as presenting it two different ways? Pardon me? Yeah, have audio clips as well, all right? So if you have a video, have narration of the audio clip. So that they can listen to that as opposed to, to um, you know, seeing the video. Have, have an explanation. Um, what about, um, by thinking, oh, the alt attribute of an image. All right, that's, that's a very common one. That, that's, uh, and a lot of web developers will tell you, I've heard web developers say this and it makes me cringe, that, yeah, my website is accessible, I use alt attributes. Well, yeah, that's like the first step. That's like the first thing that you learn to make your website accessible, but it's certainly not the only one. Um, let me see if I can find another site that was very good. Dayton, I think it was the Dayton Museum of Art. Maybe not. It is possible that also Dayton has changed their site since last time I gave this lecture. Huh. All right. Never mind. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not seeing it. But what they do, the, the site that I have in mind, again, has a collection of audio clips, has a, a collection of images, and when you click on links for an image, it will have a description of, of it. Now, again, that is useful for someone that's blind and can't see it all. That's useful for someone that doesn't have um, the best vision to maybe have some certain things in a painting pointing out, pointed out to them explicitly, but it also could benefit someone that without any disabilities is visiting the site. Okay, the visual disabilities are the most obvious ones that affect people, right? Because the web is very visual. You look at a web page, all right? What are some other disabilities that are relevant as far as surfing the web? All right. Um, 
All right, let, let, let's, let's make a list. We, we've heard so far dyslexia. We heard um, someone that was an amputee and would include in that uh, possibly paralysis. We'll, we'll, just, we'll call these um, motor control issues, whether they're uh, a, a paraplegic or they're a quadriplegic or they, um, you know, they, they don't have hands or, um, you know, um, even people that like have certain um, neuro disorders such as Parkinson's or handshake and they have a hard time controlling it. Someone with carpal tunnel, you could probably fit in this category. Anything that would affect the, the movement of a mouse, let's say, or typing on a keyboard. I'm sorry, what? Epilepsy, Epilepsy possibly. Dyslexia. What is dyslexia? Yeah, the letters kind of get jumbled. A lot of people uh, mistakenly think it's reading stuff backwards. Uh, it's not necessarily the case. It is that letters would get confused. So, for example, if you had the word B-A-D, oh, if you had the, the, the uh, word B-A-D, a person might confuse this B with a D. They might see it as being a D and think it's dad or something like that. Or the letters could get uh, interspersed, you know, uh, switched or, or whatever uh, when, they, when they view it. Let's define some of these disabilities and we'll go back and we'll talk about what we can do as web developers to assist these people and to make sure that we don't aggravate but actually accommodate um, their disabilities. So we had motor control issues, dyslexia, epilepsy, other ones. if they're deaf, hearing. And again, here is a great case for hearing, um, whereas, yes, there are people that are totally deaf. There are people that can't hear very well. But there's also people in, for example, a noisy office, all right, that might not be able to very well hear that, that forgot their headphones that day or whatever. Or in a computer lab where there's no speakers attached to the computer, all right? Or you are just in a hurry and you don't want to sit and listen to a five-minute news report. You want to skim the article. That always annoys, uh, annoys, annoys, annoys me. Yeah, exactly. That always annoys me when I want to, want to see, I see a news report and I want to look at it and the only way they show it is a video because then you have to sit through the whole video, right? Whereas I'm a pretty quick reader. I can, if it was in, in print, I could look at the article, skim, get the information I want, and then maybe decide, okay, yeah, I want to watch the video, or decide, okay, I have enough information. I kind of know why they do that. Why do you suppose they make it so that you have to watch the video? People would, yeah, possibly. They think that they're doing you a favor by giving you the easy way out. There might be another more slightly sinister reason for it. I like that. With, with Halloween coming up, I slightly sinister. <laughs> advertising, exactly. If I'm skimming a, a text article, I can ignore the advertising. If I have to watch the video, they can shove the advertisement in my face and I have to see it. So my guess is that's probably why a lot of news organizations do that. They, they force you to watch their ad prior to that, whereas they know that if you're reading that you're going to, you know. I mean, people's, you know, people's, people are so used to seeing ads on web pages that their brain sort of becomes an ad blocker, right? You, you know, you, you, as you're reading it, you know that looks like an ad. I'm going to ignore that, you know. Whereas, again, with a video, it's in your face and, and you have to see it. All right. So, yes, absolutely hearing and all the different variations of that. Someone in a noisy room, someone that's slightly hard of hearing, someone that doesn't want to take the time to listen to that. That's an, another example. What's another example of 
uh, a disability that would affect people's, uh, we, uh, the, we, the manner in which people access the web. All right, all sorts of mental or cognitive disabilities. All right. Um, yeah, I, I suppose so. Uh, like someone that, that wasn't uh, particularly good at reading. Um, I mean, again, you know, there's only so much that you can do on a web page to assist people. If your web page needs a lot of text on it and someone can't read, th there's no way that you can do uh, that. But if people simply have a difficulty reading, you can do some things to help it and make it easier for them. And, and, and we'll, uh, again, I want to just de define some of these conditions now, and then we'll go in and we'll talk about some of the things that you can do for those. Probably next time we'll wrap this up and we'll uh, start whatever the next topic is. I don't, I don't have my notes, so I don't remember what the next topic is. Associated with that, and the same lines as that, would be someone who has ADHD. All right. I don't have that on screen. All right. ADHD. Yeah, that would be another example. Anything else besides these? Different language? Hi, uh, you, Okay, go ahead. Right. 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 Yeah. That would, again, you, you couldn't, you know, no organization could make their website so that every language in the world would understand it. But if you know that you are dealing with, or, you know, if you're dealing with a population, if your users, again, this all gets back to the, pro, the, the design of this, right? If your typical users, if one of your personas is someone that speaks another language, then try to accommodate that. For example, you know, in many parts of the U.S., you know, there's a high Spanish-speaking population. So it would be a good idea if you're an organization, especially in one of those areas, but really, you know, even throughout the country, to have an English and a Spanish um, just, uh, you know, it wasn't a website per se, but I got my um, absentee ballot in the mail. Um, and every, you know, to, to vote uh, for the election coming up. Uh, and the instructions were written in English and Spanish. And I don't know if they do that throughout the nation or if just, I know in Lorain County there's a lot of Spanish-speaking people, but yes. Okay. Okay, exactly. Well, you, could, you, would, you would have to make explicitly different versions of it. Yeah, you, you could make. But again, if that's something that your population, your target population, um, you know, you knew that there were a lot of Spanish-speaking people, then you might want to go and do something like that. In Canada, for example, I know, I think it's even the law that, that you present things both in French and English. All right? Uh, maybe that's just in Quebec. I, I don't know. And... and I, yeah, definitely in Quebec. I know they're very uh, adamant about their French speakingness. All right, uh, but uh, is the the independence movement yeah. that that's Quebec? Okay. Yeah, I, 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 Ontario. And again, please, I hope no one from Canada watches this. But Ontario almost could be like another state, right? I mean, Ontario is like part of the United States, or Quebec definitely has a, a, a different uh, flavor to it. Um, so the idea is, and, and what we're going to do, and, and I, I challenge you to think about this for next time, is we have defined a list of disabilities. Now we can throw into the mix things such as age-related conditions. In other words, People, as they get older, they don't necessarily have motor control issues as severe as someone who is a paraplegic or quadriplegic or has Parkinson's or something like that. 
but, or, uh, or that, but it's harder for old, older people with arthritis and so on to control the mouse than it would be for someone that is, you know, young and 100% fit. Older people aren't all deaf, but many older people have lost a little bit of their hearing. All right. ADHD, there's all, you know, there's, there's, there's people that are, that don't have ADHD, but are prone to distraction, just as anyone that, you know, just as anyone can be from time to time. So keep in mind when we define these disabilities that there are, there are the full-blown versions of these disabilities, but there's also sort of, I don't want to say milder versions of these, but there's also people that may have some of the same sort of symptoms as people that have this, these disabilities. All right? Let's think for next time, and this is how we'll start class next time, of what we can do as web developers. All right, there's the assistive technology end of it, you know. But what can we do as web developers to help people that have these different conditions and other related conditions that may be similar? And let's think about that in a way that it will also help people that have no disabilities. Or at the very least, it won't be intrusive to them. Just like the braille outside the door may not help someone that can see. You know, no one that can see is going to look, you know, is going to use the braille to determine what room it is. But at the very least, it doesn't get in your way. All right? And that's truly the, the notion of universal design. All right? We'll pick up on this on Monday of next week. All right, have a great weekend, everyone.